Hi, I'm Jenny Goodwin. I am a nurse and I work at the Blue Ridge Poison Center. And today we're going to talk about snake bites. So for our objectives today, we are going to talk about snake bites as a worldwide problem, not just something that affects us in our local area or in our country of the U.S. Um, and we're going to talk about some general types of venom and review some general classifications of venomous snakes, especially those that pertain to the United States. Uh, we're going to look at some signs and symptoms of treatment for U.S. snake bites, and we're going to review new developments for treatment. So snake bites are labeled as a neglected public health issue in lots of countries around the world, especially in the tropical and subtropical countries in Latin America, Asia, and Africa. The WHO estimates that about 93 million people live in those highest risk areas, which is a huge number of people exposed to snake bites. We don't know exact numbers of snake bite victims. But the World Health Organization estimates that about 5.4 million people are bitten every year. That's a huge number of bites, but only about half of those actually are envenomed or have in the venom injected by the snake. The CDC statistics also tell us that in the U.S., only about seven or 8,000 venomous snake bites occur every year. And we'll look a little bit more about numbers in the U.S. on our next slide. Most of the bites worldwide um, also are accompanied by huge morbidity and mortality. And those occur in countries of Asia, like India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, or Sri Lanka, also in sub-Saharan Africa and Central and South America. The snake bites often disproportionately affect people in rural regions and poor populations, such as farmers, women, and children. There's two common bite patterns. First are bites to extremities, like a hand, an arm, a foot, an ankle, or a leg. Those often occur when farmers or agricultural workers are out working in their rice paddies or gardens or fields and accidentally disturb a snake. They also can occur when people are out doing their daily activities like gathering firewood or water. Second um, common bite pattern are bites to the head and trunk by nocturnal snakes. Those often occur in rural areas again and in the homes of farmers, hunters, or fishermen where people oftentimes sleep on the floor. The risk for snake bites goes up dramatically during the rainy season, and especially after flooding, when snakes are literally flooded out of their burrows. Over half of snake bites in African Asia are not treated with what we would consider conventional medical therapy, which makes the morbidity and mortality much more understandable. There are about 3,700 species of snakes worldwide. But of that large number, only about 15% are actually venomous to humans. There are about 600 distinct species of known venomous snakes with a very wide distribution to every continent except Antarctica. Of course, more species are found in warm and tropical regions. Most snake bites are from non-venomous snakes. In the U.S., about 160 species of snakes are found, but of that number, only about 20 are actually poisonous or venomous. There's about 16 species of rattlesnakes, two species of water moccasins, there's the copperhead, and there are three types of coral snakes in the United States. This graph is pulled from our National Poison Data System and shows numbers of snake bites and poisonings that are reported to the National Poison Data System between 2010 and 2019. You can see the numbers range from the 6,000 to the 7,000 mark, uh, which doesn't exactly match with our CDC statistics, but again, not all snake bites are reported to the National Poison Data System. When we talk about mortality, we're talking about deaths from the snake bites. And we have figures of a huge range. Anywhere from 81,000 to 138,000 people are recorded to die each year from snake bites. 
but the actual deaths that are recorded are expected to be extremely underestimated because many of the known venomous bites that occur in these developing countries with poor access to healthcare and underdeveloped health reporting systems, it's likely that these numbers are hugely underestimated because they don't have a good record-keeping system. It's hard for some governments to have accurate numbers of deaths. For example, an article published by a German paper, Deutsche Well, showed that a huge community-level study of snake bite deaths in India arrived at a direct estimate of deaths that was about 30 times greater than that officially recorded by the government. As a comparison, the three-year outbreak of Ebola from 2014 to 2016 killed around 11,000 people. But in that same time frame, up to 400,000 people died from snake bite. That's 40 times the death toll for snake bites versus Ebola. So you can see that snake bite is definitely an underestimated and underrecognized public health issue. Per NIOSH, the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, about 7 to 8,000 people will be bitten by venomous snakes in the United States each year but only about five will actually die. The number of deaths in the U.S. would be much higher if people did not seek medical care. This graph shows us a good estimation of snake bite deaths worldwide, um, and it comes from the World Health Organization via Welcome Trust. You can see that the red dot for the U.S. and Canada is tiny, and compare that to the huge red circle for Asia, and you can see across the world an estimate of deaths that occur yearly. So we've talked about deaths, and now we're going to talk about injury or disability or disfigurement. About three times the number of people who die from snake bites are maimed or disfigured because of the results of their snake bite, and they end up with permanent disabilities. We estimate that a quarter to a half million persons per year are disabled from snake bites. 80% of people in developing countries do not have ready access to health care or anti-venin, and instead they resort to using home remedies or looking for local healers. Barriers to care that these people may face include the proximity of health care, again, because they are in rural areas, the availability of the antivenin, if it's even out there or if the place of medical care that they seek has it available, and the cost of care. If they are able to reach health care, antivenin only exists for about 60% of all snakes in the world. And even if the antivenin does exist, it's extremely expensive, with an estimated cost in these rural areas of about $160 a vial. That sounds cheap to us in the U.S., but for them, that means a course of bite treatment therapy that could cost eight to $1,600. And when you look at the annual income of an agricultural worker that might only be $200, that puts it out of reach of a lot of people. For the NIOSH in the U.S., disability or permanent injury, which is considered the loss or part of all of a finger or the finger's function, is much more common than the mortality in U.S. snake bites. Between 10 and 44% of rattlesnake bite patients experience some sort of disability or permanent injury after being bitten. These are a couple of photos of some of the morbidity that can be experienced by persons in other countries. The left side picture is scarring and contractures that this girl experienced after a black-necked spitting cobra bite. And the right-sided picture is disability after a puff adder envenomation to his arm. For victims that survive their bites, many times the tissue destruction to the hands or arms or feet and legs is so severe that amputation is the only option of treatment. This graphic is provided by Welcome Trust, and it is a wonderful uh, overview of everything we've just talked about in this first section of the presentation. Every five minutes around the world, 50 people are bitten by a snake. Of those 50 people, about half of them, or 25, will be envenomed or injected with venom. Four of those people will be permanently disabled, and one of them will die. Now we're going to move on to actual components of venom, types of snake, 
um, and what we see more here in the U.S. Venom is a poisonous, usually yellow fluid. It's a form of saliva. It's used by the snakes to immobilize and digest their prey. It's composed of proteins, enzymes, and other molecules, and it's stored in modified salivary glands that are found on either side of the snake's head. The glands are enclosed in a muscular sheath, and the sheath contracts when the snake bites. The venom is then pushed forward and ejected through the fangs into its victim. Venom potency and effect can vary between the species, but it can also vary between different snakes of the same species. There are different types of venom. I'm going to break it down into three general classifications, hemotoxic, cytotoxic, and neurotoxic. Hemotoxic venom acts directly on the heart and cardiovascular system. It works on the clotting factors in the blood or the lining of the blood vessels. Bites are not largely painful, and symptoms can be delayed while the venom is wreaking havoc inside. Bleeding from the bite site or from mucous membranes in the mouth or nose might be the first outward signs. With some snakes, which is common with copperheads or western diamondbacks, blood blisters can develop near the bite site, which is caused by bleeding underneath the skin. Of note, even with hemotoxic venom, the toxins that damage the blood also cause damage to other tissues. Although we often think of a blood thinning effect, some hemotoxins produce the opposite effect and cause the blood to clot. In those bites, death can occur from excessive clotting, which causes a heart attack. So we can see deaths from clotting or from internal bleeding. North American viper venom, such as rattlesnakes, copperheads, and cotton mouths, primarily consist of hemotoxic components. But again, snakes can have a mix of different types of venom. Cytotoxic venom creates local tissue destruction, which starts at the site of the bite. It's composed of proteins that attack and break down the tissues. And remember, tissue destruction equals pain. Cytotoxic venom functions on a cellular level by breaking down the actual cell membranes. It effectively destroys the tissue, cell by cell. Venom may also attack specific organ tissues, such as kidneys, and you'll hear about nephrotoxic venom, the heart tissue, and you'll hear cardiotoxic venom, and the muscles, which is known as myotoxic venom, which are all breakdowns of cytotoxic venom. These bites manifest with instant pain, swelling, bruising, and blistering at the bite site. Symptoms will spread, generally proximally, as the venom circulates through the body. Muscle tissue destroyed by the venom is released into the bloodstream. This causes kidney damage or kidney failure as the kidneys are unable to properly filter out the material. Death from cytotoxic venom occurs from organ failure. Morbidity can include missing digits or limbs and decreased kidney function. Neurotoxic venom acts on the nerve synapses and interferes with nerve function. The elapid snake family venom is composed primarily of neurotoxic components. But that being said, some snakes from other families also produce neurotoxic venom. These bites incur minimal pain, but early symptoms can include drooping eyelids, slurred speech, difficulty swallowing, increase in oral secretions. Death will occur from respiratory failure due to diaphragmatic paralysis. Most species with neurotoxic venom do not cause permanent nerve damage if the patient survives. Some species, such as the Asian crates, can cause either semi-permanent or permanent damage, and Australia's Colette snake causes permanent loss of taste or smell, even after a successful bite treatment. We're going to look at two main types of snakes or snake families, the elapids and the, the paridae. So elapidae snakes are all venomous, some more than others. They have short fixed fangs that are in the front of their upper jaws. Aside from the coral snake and the yellow-bellied sea snake that can be found in or around the United States, this family also includes many snakes from other countries, including the Australian copperhead, cobras, crates, mambas, sea snakes, coral snakes, and the taipan. 
The elapidae venom is mainly neurotoxic, although some species contain cardiotoxins and cytotoxins. So as you can see, there's no rule of that every snake will fit into. Elapid snake bites differ from the viparidae snake bites. Elapid snakes strike and then hold on to or chew on their victims for venom delivery. Since the venom delivery system isn't as efficient as that of a viper, it can take longer to deliver their load of venom. Thus, holding on to their prey allows better venom delivery. Bites are considered fairly painless for neurotoxic venom only, but the victim will die from paralysis of the heart and lungs, and death may be rapid. Coral snakes are the only elapids native to the U.S. All elapid snake bites should be evaluated medically and observed, as some people do not have symptoms immediately. In the United States, coral snake bites can actually be dry or have no venom injected up to 50% of the time. An interesting fact about these snakes, they generally lay eggs, although some will give live birth. The viparidae is a family of snakes that have longer fangs than the elapidae. Instead of fixed, their fangs are hinged and this allows them to penetrate deeper for venom injection. Vipers can vary widely in size, but most are more heavy-bodied in comparison to the more slender elapidae. Venom within this family can vary, but are generally cytotoxic and hemotoxic. It typically contains protein-degrading enzymes that produce pain, tissue destruction, and coagulopathies. The venom may also affect the blood cells and blood vessels and cause vessel damage and hemolysis. Death generally results from hypotension. Morbidity can range from scarring to amputation. Although most vipers are not neurotoxic, it's not a hard and fast rule. Some vipers produce neurotoxic symptoms and some elapids include cytotoxic symptoms. Note of interest, vipers typically give live birth, but some lay eggs. So looking a little closer at the venomous snakes in the U.S., there are the two families that we just talked about, the elapidae and the viparidae. Within the elapidae, there are the three species of coral snake, the eastern coral snake, the Texas coral snake, and the Arizona coral snake. The yellow-bellied sea snake I'm listing here, although I didn't list it on a previous slide, um, doesn't technically live within the U.S., but can be found off of the Southern California coast. Its neurotoxic venom is extremely potent and also contains toxins attacking the muscles. Moving to the Viparidae family, there are multiple types of rattlesnakes in the U.S., and those include the tiger, the massasagua, the timber, the western diamondback, the eastern diamondback, and the Mojave rattlesnakes. Locally in our area of central and southwest Virginia, the timber rattler is the only one um, that we find in our region. Most snake bite fatalities actually occur from rattlesnake bites. The venom with rattlesnakes can vary by the species and by the region, but it contains in general a mix of cytotoxic and hemotoxic venom. The Mojave of note also contains neurotoxins and is considered one of the most dangerous in the U.S. The copperhead, also a snake found in our local area, tends to be mostly hemotoxic and it causes temporary local tissue damage. Copperhead bites can be very painful, but they're rarely fatal. The water moccasin produces hemotoxic venom, and although it's dangerous, those bites are rarely fatal. I've included a few pictures for you of rattlesnakes. Rattlesnakes being vipers have the classic characteristics often thought of in relation to poisonous snakes. They have a broad triangular head, it narrows at the neck, they have elliptical pupils, heat-sensing pits, and retractable fangs. They also have another addition to their arsenal, which is the rattles, and you see that in two of the three pictures. Their habitats vary by the species and by the region that they're found in. You can find them in mountains and rocky outcroppings, sandy deserts, forests, and wetlands. A rattle is a classic identifier of rattlesnakes, but remember, not all rattlesnakes will have a rattle. Young rattlesnakes start out with only one button on their tail, and space for additional buttons is created as the snake grows and molts its skin. 
Snakes can lose their rattles, and it might be a period of time until they develop another one. Coloration between rattlesnakes can vary widely between the species, and you can see in these pictures how different they are. They can be found with shades of gray, black, brown, tan, orange, red, and even some muted greens. Again, as we mentioned earlier, most rattlesnakes inject hemotoxic venom, but the Mojave, found in the southwest United States, has a mix of hemotoxic and neurotoxic. Bull snakes can be confused for rattlesnakes with their coloration and their defensive behavior. Although it's not poisonous and it lacks a triangular head, it can flatten its head with a defensive posture and it makes it hard to distinguish from the rattlesnake. This is a graph showing the geographic distribution of rattlesnakes in the U.S. And as you can see, rattlesnakes are found in many parts of the U.S. Moving on to copperheads and cottonmouths. Copperheads have an hourglass-shaped marking on their bodies. They tend to have a stout body with a narrow, tapering tail. Their colors can range from browns to grays but the hourglass pattern tends to be more copper or reddish brown, and that's classic for the copperheads. They have a broad triangular head, narrows at the neck. Their pupils are elliptical, and they have the heat-sensing pits and the retractable fangs. Copperheads have a very diverse habitat, and they can live in urban or rural areas in the southeast U.S. Corn snakes, eastern rat snakes, and some water snakes can be confused with the copperhead, but they don't have exactly the same markings. Cottonmouths are a relative of the copperheads. They're known for the white interior of their mouths, and when they are disturbed, they'll open their mouths and show the inside in an aggressive display. They have the classic broad triangular head, narrow neck, and a stout body. Their colors can vary from browns to grays, and again, they tend to have a thick body, but they also have a thick tail. Juvenile copperheads and cottonmouths have bright yellow tails, presumably as a way to attract prey when they're young, and they tend to be smaller than rattlesnakes. Coral snakes. Again, three different types. On this left side, we've shown you pictures of the eastern coral snake. Many people think of venomous snakes as having what we previously described for the last three types of snake with a triangular head, elliptical pupils, and retractable fangs, the heat-sensing pits, but none of these characteristics fit the coral snake. These snakes have rounded heads, round pupils, they don't have heat-sensing pits, and they have short, fixed fangs that do not retract. Coral snakes are on the smaller side. Although their venom is extremely toxic and dangerous, they tend to be shy, and bites are rare for truly accidental encounters. The volume of venom injected, volume for volume, when compared with the vipers, is much less. There's a common rhyme that many of you may have heard that's used to identify the coral snake from its non-venomous lookalikes. You may have heard, red on yellow, kill a fellow, red on black, friend of Jack or red on black, venom black. Another identifier that people may use is that the coral snake generally has a black face while its mimickers do not. So the rhyme, although it's catchy, is not actually as reliable as we might think. It provides an accurate description of normal coral snakes in the US, but it is not at all an appropriate identifier for coral snakes around the world as they can have very different color schemes and patterns. Even within the United States, while the rhyme is largely appropriate to delineate the color pattern of most U.S. coral snakes, there's a surprising amount of documented aberrancies in the coral snake patterns and colorations. Examples of this include melanism, or excessive black pigment, which you can see on the photo in the upper right, albinism, or lack of black pigment, which you can see on the bottom right, or other varying color patterns, and you can see an example in the middle right. There are multiple non-poisonous lookalikes, including the scarlet snake, the milk snake, and the sonner and shovel nose snake. The scarlet and milk snakes usually have a red on black stripe, but the sonner and shovel nose snake has a red on yellow stripe pattern. Snakes can be pretty difficult to identify, 
especially during the heightened mental and emotional anxiety and fear that result from any close encounter of a snake bite and a potentially venomous snake being anywhere near you. As many bites occur at dawn or dusk or when reaching into areas that aren't really visualized well, identification of a snake that bites a person can be even more difficult and sometimes absolutely impossible. Remember, in case of a snake bite, it is not necessary to bring a snake with you to get good medical treatment. Never increase the risk of a bite for yourself or anyone else by attempting to capture or handle a snake. If you're able to get a picture of a snake from a distance with no further risk, a picture might be useful. Physical description of what you saw and a geographical location of where the snake was located may also be extremely useful. In the absence of good snake identification, the patient's symptoms and the labs can be great indicators of the type of snake that might have bitten someone, and these are often the biggest determinants for what treatment a patient might receive. Here you can see a photo of Copperhead Snake Range and the Western and Eastern Coral Snake Ranges, which you can see are much smaller than the Rattlesnake Ranges. So bite prevention, a lot of this is totally common sense. It might seem extremely basic to state, don't play with snakes, whether or not you think they're venomous. Remember, venomous snakes have lookalikes, and there are aberrancies, even in expected patterns and colorations. Alcohol and tomfoolery don't bode well with venomous snakes. Also, remember that severed snake heads can still bite and inject venom for a good period of time after the snake's head is cut off. Don't try to pick up a snake's head. Wear boots or shoes when you're outside when walking in long grass and or at dawn and dusk, which is the time that many snake bites are reported. If you're gardening or reaching into an area you can't visualize, wear thick gloves. And if somebody is bitten, do not risk another bite to capture the offending snake. Take a picture to identify it if you can without getting too close. Bite signs and symptoms. One of the first things you'll look for is a puncture wound or wounds. How many do you see? Is there pain? How soon did the pain start? And how is the pain described? Is there swelling? And is the swelling moving? Is there discoloration, bruising, or blood blisters? Does the patient have nausea or vomiting? Any paresthesias or complaint of tingling? Any bleeding from the bite site or any other location? Is there any sign of muscle weakness or paralysis? First aid do's. Do stay calm. Do immobilize the bite site. What I mean by that is keep the extremity or wherever the bite was located from moving as much as possible. Keep the bite site at the level of the heart. Remove any constricting items, expect swelling to occur, and proactively remove any items like jewelry that might cause a tourniquet effect as swelling progresses. Seek medical evaluation and call the poison center. Things not to do. Many of these you might have heard as first aid do's in the past, but these are now first aid don'ts. Incision and suction. Don't do it. It's not shown to significantly decrease the venom burden, and it causes tissue injury, bleeding, and it also causes a potential infection risk. Electric shock therapy. That was based on reports of a mission doctor who used it in the 1980s, but subsequent research has not been shown to be effective, and it's also noted to be associated with tissue injury. Heat or ice. Avoid them both. They can worsen the severity of local tissue damage. Tourniquet use. Don't do it. It increases tissue ischemia, distal to the application, and it can cause significantly increased morbidity. Compression bandage, you'll notice, has a star. It's generally discouraged in the United States with most indigenous snakes because we have good access to health care and there's not a high incidence of mortality. This may be utilized in other areas. Bite grades and severity, there is a scoring system, but of note, it's generally used for research purposes. The scale goes from 0 to 4. Grade 0 is no symptoms. Grade 1 shows local swelling, but with normal labs and no systemic symptoms. 
grade two shows swelling extending 6 to 12 inches from the bite. There may be some abnormal labs, but there's no bleeding, and there's minor or mild systemic symptoms. Grade 3 has swelling that extends greater than 12 inches from the bite. There is the presence of tissue damage. There is multiple or severe systemic symptoms and immediate presentation of symptoms with rapid progression. There may be abnormal labs and there may be bleeding. And grade 4 bites show rapid development with severe local reactions, significant tissue damage, abnormal labs with bleeding, severe swelling that may obstruct blood flow, or affect the opposite side of the body, and grade 4 can also include death. Treatment for snake bites, and this tends to focus more on snake bites within the U.S. One of the first things that we recommend after your first aid is to trend circumferential measurements. And what I mean by that is looking for the presence of swelling and the progression of swelling. The way to do it is to take a skin marker and mark two to three locations on the skin proximal to the bite site, and then record serial measurements at least every 60 minutes of those marked locations until the rate of swelling has clearly slowed. This is super helpful to be able to determine the need for antivenin and or if repeat antivenin may be needed. Elevation of the bite site at or above the level of the heart is the primary means of swelling and pain control when you are treating a snake bite. This differs with the first aid before you arrive at medical care where you keep the bite site at the level of the heart to decrease venom circulation. But once you are in medical treatment, elevation is important to decrease swelling. Pain management the biggest thing here is to avoid any NSAIDs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Examples of these are aspirin, meloxicam, naproxen, ibuprofen. Acetaminophen is okay. It is not an NSAID. The reason to avoid NSAIDs is because of the theoretical risk for increased bleeding and swelling. Labs are important, especially the platelet count and the INR. Tetanus prophylaxis should be performed, but avoiding a fasciotomy is extremely important. Fasciotomies on snake bite patients are shown to increase healing time and cause worse outcomes. Fasciotomy should never be performed unless there is a documented compartment syndrome with measured compartment pressures. Also, we avoid prophylactic antibiotics, as infections from snake bites are really not that common. Crofab is one of the two FDA-approved products to treat all North American pit vipers. It's considered safe for adult and pediatric patients, and it is a sheep-derived antivenin. Use is contraindicated for patients with a known hypersensitivity to the antivenin or its components, or to papaya or propane as they are used in production, unless the benefits outweigh potential risks and appropriate treatment for anaphylaxis is available. Other allergies to ask about are pineapple, thimerosal, alpha-gal, and sheep. Alpha-gal is the red meat allergy from tick-borne illness. Recommendations will differ regarding when to start the antivenin and how much to use, but a generally accepted guideline is to start with four vials given over an hour. Redosing can be considered for significantly progressing symptoms or until coagulopathies stabilize. Anavipe is the newest FDA-approved product approved to treat North American rattlesnake envenomation. It's considered safe for adult and pediatric patients. It's an antivenin derived from horse protein manufactured in Mexico and distributed by a company in Tennessee, and it's only been available since 2018. Use is contraindicated for patients with a known hypersensitivity to the antivenin and or horse protein or horse serum, unless, again, benefits outweigh potential risks and appropriate treatment for anaphylaxis is available. For the manufacturer, a generally accepted guideline is to start with 10 vials given over an hour. Additional doses can be given to achieve control of the symptoms, and a lesser dose can be given for late dosing if needed after prolonged observation. Redosing is considered for significantly progressing symptoms or until coagulopathies stabilize. 
North American coral snake antivenin is a equine-derived product and formerly was produced by with Pfizer. It's the only FDA-approved antivenin for coral snakes. With Pfizer halted production in 2003, and in order to maintain available product, the remaining batches were tested by the FDA yearly and their expiration dates were extended. Per the FDA website, the last extension for the antivenin went through January 31 of 2019. While the old product is still available, resources state that the production has resumed. The antivenin is not available at all hospitals, but it is obtainable. An alternative antivenin, Coral Men, is produced in Mexico. It is not FDA approved, but it is used in some locations. Coral snake bites should be monitored for 24 hours to ensure delayed symptoms do not develop. Coral snake antivenin does not reverse symptoms. It simply halts progression of symptoms. And the antivenin should be given at the first signs of any neurologic impairment. When we talk about labs, I'm going to talk very specifically about the most important labs for our poison center region. And again, the venomous snakes that we cover are the copperhead and the timber rattlesnake. For those snakes, the most important labs that we look at are the platelets and the PTINR. A decrease in the platelet count or an increase in the INR concerning for rattlesnake envenomations. It's not common to see lab abnormalities in a copperhead bite. Patients can develop lab abnormalities and unnoticed bleeding even without obvious fang marks and tissue damage. If any abrasions or fang marks are noted, coagulation studies should be repeated prior to discharge of a patient. Other labs that you may see asked for in different areas of the country will be the CBC, the CMP, the PT, PTT, INR, and fibrinogen. Exotic snakes. So there are a variety of people who may have encounters with exotic venomous snakes. Zoos have them, herpetologists, daredevils, breeders can all have exotic venomous snakes. A license might be required to capture, possess, or exhibit a venomous snake by your state. Permits or licenses are often yearly, and some states actually require liability insurance if you hold a permit. In case of a bite by an exotic venomous snake, getting a photo, if safely available, is very helpful to ensure accurate identification if that snake is unknown. Zoos or wildlife centers may have antivenin, and some owners may have antivenin, but it is much more difficult to obtain in general cases. Just a couple of interesting things out there in regards to research on snake bites. I've listed three. Ophorex is a privately owned company spearheaded by a physician and a philanthropist, They're working to create a drug that can be used orally or intranasally to compete with venom binding sites and basically buy time to cover that gap between the bite and the hospital presentation, which is where the majority of snake bite deaths occur. This idea was spawned from the physician's personal experience when he accompanied a team of scientists into remote locations where the antivenin is really not accessible. Tim Friedy is also a super interesting gentleman. He is working with the Universal Antidote Endeavor by self-injecting himself with various venomous snake venom from around the world. He's done this for over 20 years, and his goal is creating human antibodies that can be used to create a universal antidote. Welcome is a nonprofit organization that works to improve health by providing funding. And in 2019, they allocated a massive amount, 80 million euros, into snake bite treatment research directly to improve antivenin production, develop new treatments, and construct a regulatory system for product distribution around the world. So I hope you've learned a little bit about snakes and snake bites. And to throw out there, the National Poison Prevention Hotline is 800 222 1222. They are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year to answer your questions. 
about snake bite if someone you know is bitten. Thanks for joining us, and we hope you have a good day.